You know, ladies, if you're going to describe the things that are going on in our world today in one sentence or one word, what would it be? Blinded and fearful. Blinded and fearful. It's like closed off to Jesus. Closed off to Jesus. Okay, those are both really good. Well, last week, Pastor Greg delivered a message about how the things that are going on in our world and even the things going on in our country are directly described in Bible prophecy. This week, Pastor Greg is going to be teaching us a lot about common sense. So here is Pastor Greg's message with Perilous Times Will Come, Part 2. Turn your Bibles to 2 Timothy, please. 2 Timothy, chapter 3. Who has had one of those weeks? Anybody had one of those weeks? Anybody? Yep. Doesn't it feel great to be in the house of the Lord this morning, then? Amen. Amen to that, huh? Well, as most of you know, Calvary chapels are verse-by-verse teachers. We're, very, we're extremely exegetical. We will take a book of the Bible. On Wednesday nights, we're going through the book of Judges verse-by-verse. On Sunday mornings, we're going verse-by-verse through the book of Revelation, which is not a difficult uh, book of the Bible to understand, uh, but we are taking a few weeks to do a prophecy update. Now, I always ask the question, uh, because not everybody, where I'm from, everybody knows what a prophecy update is, but I'm just going to give a quick review of what it is. All we are doing is comparing, is comparing the Word of God to the headlines of what we read in the paper today, in our news media, everything that's, and, and try to make sense of it according to a biblical standard. Easy peasy, you got that? Look at somebody and say, I got this. Look at somebody like you mean it, like I got this. All right, 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3. will be our theme verses for this particular prophecy update. Hmm. Look, I want you to read this from your Bibles, and I'm not even super, well, I just don't want you to get addicted to looking on the screen. I want you to be looking in your Bibles. So 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, read it with me, either off the screen or from your Bibles. You choose, right? Verse 1. But know this, that it, everybody... Know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying its power, and from such people turn away. Can you see the common sense that this passage is clearly defining the condition of our nation and the nations around the world? How many nations? 195? How many countries are there in the world? Who are my historians here? Who are 100 and what? 95, right? Almost 200. Let's just call it almost, almost 200. Then we'll, then we'll be right. Common sense. How many of you, don't raise your hands, because somebody sitting next to you might disagree with you. How many of you think that you have, that you operate under common sense? Okay? Some of you still raised your hands. I know, I go, it's all right, okay? Here's the deal. How would you grade yourself? How would you grade yourself on common sense? Think about uh, that question as I share this, uh, this story about uh, when, uh, when uh, Sherlock Holmes and his sidekick, who's his sidekick? Watson, I presume, right? Dr. Watson, they go on a camping trip. Have you heard this? They go on a camping trip. They lay down to go to sleep. Holmes says, uh, Watson, look up in the sky and tell me, tell me what you see. So Watson said, I see millions of stars, and Holmes replied, and what does that tell you? What does that tell you? Uh, Watson replies, well, well, astronomically, it tells me that there are millions of galaxies and potentially billions of planets. Theologically, it tells me that God is great and that we are small. Climactically, it tells me that we have uh, that we will have a beautiful day tomorrow. Watson then says to Holmes, 
Well, what does that tell you? And Holmes says, it tells me that somebody stole our tent. <laughs> somebody, stole our, somebody stole our tent. Some people overlook the obvious. Who are the people that overlook the obvious? I know a bunch of them. I know a bunch of them. And we cannot be looking, overlooking the obvious these days, especially when it's right in front of us. In, in no situation is that more true than of the decisions that are being made that have the world on a direct beeline to the new world order. And most folks are clueless that these changes are, they're, they're paving, they're paving the way for what the Antichrist will institute in Revelation 13. Now, the good news is, if you're a Christian, you won't be here for that. If you're not a Christian, you will go through the seven-year tribulation. When we get back to chapter 6 in the book of Revelation, but it's important. Uh, class is in session. Look at the person next to you and say, Bible study is in session. So that means you should have your Bibles in your hands, you should have a notepad out, and be ready to take some notes. Study to show yourselves approved, a workman who need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Word of truth. Okay. Everything will make so much more sense when you realize uh, the big picture. So last week, last week we, uh, we discussed the wisdom of viewing the world transforming event headlines of the last 420, 430 days with the headlines of the Bible. All the craziness only makes sense when you go to God and his word for answers. I want you to read this with me. This is Psalm 73, verses 13 and 14. Read it with me. When I thought how to understand this, it was too painful for me until I went into the sanctuary of God then. What? I understood. I understood its end. All the crazy decisions we are watching people make today can only make sense when we see how they fit into these five categories, remember we went over these last week, these five categories of, uh, well, they're New World Order categories of a uh, one world government, a uh, one world economy, a one world currency, a one world religion, and a one world leader. Are you ready to have your common sense tested this morning? Are you ready? I just came to church, man. I want to come in and... Clap my hands to some upbeat music, and I didn't know this was a test. Yes, that's why you come to church, to learn and to grow. What is it, it's 2 Peter 3, 18, but grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord. Good thing, good thing. All right, so we're going to test your common sense. Now, considering and what I want you to do, I want you to consider these five categories in light of what the Bible teaches about the last days. Now, overall principle of what we're seeing on a daily basis, why? Why the push? Why the push to cause international division and instability in governments? Why? Why? Look at that. To set us up for what? The one world government, okay? Number two, why the push to flood the U.S. system with freshly printed unpaid for monies? Right? Hello, to devalue the dollar, cause massive inflation, bankrupt our economy in order to create a one world economy with a planetary supply chain. Have you thought this all the way through? With a planetary supply chain. Can anybody say Amazon? Amazon. There you go. Amazon all working together to form a one world digital currency like... Bitcoin, Litecoin, and our own nation's FedCoin. Have you heard about FedCoin? Anybody who is going to start receiving government assistance in any manner, guess what manner it's going to start coming to you in? Digital form. Digital form. Not going to send out checks anymore. Digital form. It's all coming, probably within the next year. Okay, number three. Why is there in the Christian church... So much apostasy and a defection from the faith once for all 
given to the saints. Have you noticed that? People who claim to be Christians, but the word of God is not their absolute authority. Political correctness is, or how they, how they feel. We don't have that option. If you're a believer in Christ, you're a believer in Christ's word. Amen. And we follow what the word of God says. Well, why is there this defection from the faith, once for all given to the saints, in preparation for the one world religion led by the false prophet? And number four, um, why stoke the flame of confusion and disagreements with world leaders as well as accepting? Do you ever think about some of the world leaders that are, uh, they're dictators, you know, they're dictators like uh, China's Xi Jinping or Russia's Putin, Turkey's Erdogan, North Korea's Kim Jong-un. They're dict. Why does the world tolerate that? Duh. To set us up for what? Its final one world dictator leader, the Antichrist. This is Satan's man with a plan, right? He's Satan's man with a plan who will claim to have all the answers for, for unity and he'll, he'll end uh, world hunger and disease and, and he'll provide peace in the Middle East and, and he's going to tell us how to end terrorism and poverty and establish the Green New Deal, right? <laughs> right? All of those things. So, so just when you're reading the headlines, when you're watching your TV, when you're watching TV, just think these things Think these things through. Uh, I would even encourage you, most of you won't do this, but I encourage you, um, write down, write down these five categories on a post-it or somewhere, something larger, and just tape it to the side of your TV that you can see it. And I promise you, almost, almost everything that you hear these commentators talking about are going to fit into one of these five categories. That's why I'm trying to train you just to think biblically. Think biblically. So, uh, in part one, uh, we established that the world is truly, it's in perilous times. Perilous times, just like we read. But know this, that in the last days will what? Come, yeah, perilous times. See, the perilous times, you see the powers of the nations align to begin what we talked about last week as the great research, uh, which is basically new speech for what? The new world order. Yeah, nothing, nothing is difficult to understand if you are thinking biblically. This is extremely uh, uh, important and worth writing down. If you have not written anything else down this morning, grab your pen, your pencil, your notebook, something, crayon, lipstick, I don't care, write this down. It's going to help you. Here it is. Before the new world order can come, the old world order what? It needs to go. It needs to go, including, including, we talked about this last week, including bankrupting the United States, thus removing it from superpower status. That is the only way to explain another $1.9 trillion dollar COVID, another COVID stimulus. Have you done your research on this? How much of that almost $2 trillion actually goes towards COVID items? Six to nine percent. Six to nine percent actually go to coronavirus needs. It's the only reason that it explains why the government unjustifiably, you know, keep the, keep the mask mandates and, and all the stay-at-home orders in place as long as you can because now, in just one year, people have become addicted to what? Government money. Guess, guess whose money that is? It's our money, right? It's all our taxpayer, our taxpayer Money. They become addicted to the government signing their paycheck, and, uh, and people are making more money staying at home than they are working. How many of you have talked to the managers of every institute that you, whether it's a restaurant, whether it's uh, Lowe's, whether it's any, any place you go, you talk to the manager, they cannot find people that will work. 
And they, they're looking for a shoulder to cry on. They really are. Uh, and I, I've talked to a whole bunch of them, and they're just saying, I can't find anybody who will work. Well, there's a reason. Just understand the reason behind, behind these things. You know, personally, I, I'm not even sure I can fault these people for staying home. I mean, if the government is going to pay you more to stay home and play Call of Duty all day, right, or something else, uh, Candy Crush, how about that, uh, all day, I know that's old, that's just dated me, huh, because Candy Crush is like four years old. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, why wouldn't they? Why wouldn't they? We're, we're, we're training people to do that. Now, uh, also last week, we showed three short videos revealing what the World Economic Forum and the international world leaders, and here it is. This is on both sides of the aisle, including our current president, stating their support for the New World Order using the pandemic and what's called the Great Reset as the vehicle. Now, those of us who have been teaching the coming of the New World Order for years have, have been mocked as what? Been mocked as, you're one of those what? You're one of those tinfoil hat tinfoil hat kind of guys or gals because uh, we have been warning this was coming. And we closed last week stating that the naysayers throw out the same old deflection tactic saying, you're just what? You're a conspiracy theorist. And what do, you, what do I tell you to do when that happens? You just smile and you look at them and you say, you know what? Noah, Noah was a conspiracy theorist too until what? until it started to rain. Well, guess what? Guess what? Right now, it is raining New World Order, if your eyes are open. There were mockers in Noah's day, and there are mockers in our day for simply putting our trust in the Lord. You know, Peter, the Apostle Peter, aligns uh, Noah's day and our day with this statement. Turn in your Bibles. I don't want you to just read it off of this. Turn in your Bibles, Second Peter Chapter 3, 2 Peter chapter 3, verses, uh, oh, let's just read uh, 3 through 6, 3 through 6. Knowing this first, read with me, knowing this first, that scoffers will come when? In the last days, walking according to their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. If you don't have this underlined in your Bibles, underline it now. For this they willfully forget that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water by which the world that then existed perished being flooded with water. You know, uh, the scoffers, the scoffers accuse us, right, of wearing tinfoil hats. But in reality, what is it that we have on? Our thinking caps, and we're looking at this through the filter of prophecy, what our Bibles tell us is going to happen in the last days. So all we do is stand strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Stand strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Even when the Lord has promised that in the last days there will be a mass defection. From the faith, according to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 through 5. Guess where you're going in your Bibles now? Turn your Bibles. Everybody, turn your Bibles. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 through 5. Verse 3 says, Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away. What's that word in Greek? I've trained you this, falling away is apostasia, apostasia, ap apostasia. It's not, a, it's not an Italian food dish. That's pasta, apostasia. So right now in your Bibles, next to falling away, what should you be writing down? Apostasia, right? Unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition who opposes and exalts himself, above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple. You know, that's going to happen at the midpoint 
of the tribulation period so that he sits as God in the temple showing himself that he is God. And look, look what Paul says here. Do you not remember that when I was still with you that I told you these things? Paul was only in the church of Thessalonica for how long? For how long? How long? It was three weeks, three weeks, and he's already teaching them about end times events. Already. So it's not over our heads at all. All right. Today, boys and girls, we are going to talk about apostasy. Can you say, can you say apostasy? Apostasy, right? Apostasy. Let me give you some proofs that we are well into the last day's apostasy. These stats come from the very reputable Barna Research Group in 2020, a survey titled, American Christians are redefining their faith. Remember, these stats are from professing evangelical Christians who would claim that they're born again and are attending a Bible-teaching, Bible-believing church. Now, check this out under the heading of Evangelicals are embracing secularism. Check out some of these stats. They're up there on the screen. A majority, 52% of evangelicals reject absolute moral truth. That's not a good sign, right? 61% do not read their Bible on a daily basis. 75% believe that people are basically good. When people tell me that they think people are basically good, I go, did you know that the first man ever born was a murderer? And then I just drop the mic and walk away. Cain killed his brother. And uh, no, nobody is good, right? Nobody is, nobody is good. Show me somebody who doesn't sin besides Jesus. There ain't none, right? Here's some more. All right, ready for some more stats? You might want to take your little phones out and... Click a picture of this. 48, remember these are evangelicals, 48% believe a person who is good enough or does enough good works can earn eternal salvation. So much for being saved by grace through faith, gift of God, not of works, so that what? No one can boast, right? 44% do not believe that history is the unfolding narrative of God's reality. 44% claim the Bible is ambiguous in its teaching about abortion. 40% do not believe that human life is sacred. 34% argue that abortion is morally acceptable. Remember, these are evangelicals. 43% do not believe that there is a common God-given purpose to humanity. 43% maintain that when Jesus was on earth, that he sinned that he sinned. Can you believe that? 42% seek moral guidance primarily from sources other than the Bible. 40% accept lying as morally acceptable if it advances personal interests or protects one's reputation. I've been looking for a loophole. I guess there I go, huh? Right? 34% reject the idea of legitimate marriage as one man and one woman. That's a third of evangelicals that don't believe in God's definition of marriage. Again, remember that these people identify as evangelical. And if I'll tell you this, if somebody claims to be evangelical and does not agree with what the Bible says, guess what? They are in opposition to the author of that Bible. It's a it's, it's apostasy. It's a defection from the faith. Here's a blatant example of modern-day apostasy. How many of you have ever heard of Union Theological Seminary in New York? It's founded, founded 1836. You know that Harvard and Princeton and, and Columbia, all of, those, all of those universities were originally uh, created as theological universities to train people to share the gospel. Boy, has Harvard gone a little ways in, from there, huh? Princeton. Hmm. Anyway, Union Theological Seminary 
founded in 1836, stated in its constitution that the seminary's goal was to promote the kingdom of Christ and that professors were required to affirm that they believed the scriptures of the Old and New Testament to be the word of God and the only infallible rule of faith and practice. That's a very good beginning, huh? That's a very good beginning. Fast forward almost 200 years. Today's seminary president at Union Theological Seminary doesn't even believe in Christ's atonement. She doesn't believe in the resurrection. She doesn't believe in the virgin birth. She doesn't believe in the Bible's definition of heaven, hell, and the afterlife. Plus, she doesn't believe in God's omnipotence or his omniscience. This, <laughs> this supposed Christian organization got a lot of press a couple of years ago when they got verbal about the need for all people. Look at the person next to you and say, I'm all people, okay? For all people to, to repent, which sounds biblical until you find out that they were calling people to repent to... Plants for mankind's sin against the environment. There's the headline. Union Theological Seminary students confess climate sins to plants. If that was necessary, I'd be confessing to plants every day because I eat a salad <laughs> every day. So technically, I'm eating some of their kinfolk every day. Every day, these misguided folks are confessing their sins to plants under the banner of climate change. Now, the seminary made this declaration. Today, in chapel, we confess to plants together. Ready for this? We held our grief, joy, regret, hope, guilt, and sorrow in prayer, offering them to the beings who sustain us, but whose gift we too often fail to honor. Look at the person next to you and say, these people are bonkers. <laughs> these people are bonkers. I think, uh, I think as well as praying to these plants, I think they're smoking some plant as well. <laughs> the only plant we should ever consider talking to is the burning bush. And as far as I know, that only... That only, happened, that only happened once. People who give out degrees in theology and knowing their Bible are worshiping the created thing over the creator. Romans 1 tells us a little something about that, right? Hmm. What would I confess to this plant? I mean, I'm just thinking about it. What would you confess to a plant? I would confess that this isn't even a real plant, surprise, surprise. I would confess to this plant that you know more theology than this theological seminary does. Yes, you do. Yes, you do, you good little plant, right? Little LSD flashback there from 50 years ago. I would confess that I love plants. Many of them taste great. Not kale. Not, not kale, not kale. When it comes to worshiping plants, my counsel is just leave it alone. I got on a roll here. Think about it. Where, where on the plant, where on the plant do these plant whisperers whisper? If you're going to confess your sins to some plant, where, where, where's an ear? I don't know. Plants don't have ears. Well, I, mean, I guess corn does. Does corn have? Okay, so corn maybe has ears. Hmm. I know, these are groaners, but I'm just keeping you awake. They actually wrote some, some uh, short stories about their plant confession experience. And uh, in this book, they call it Veggie Tales. Get it? Have a, oh. I don't want you to get me wrong because by the grace of God, that could be you or that could be me that is that wackadoodle that you are, you, you're, you're confessing your sins to Bob and Larry instead of the creator of the universe, the one who is responsible for our every heartbeat 
and our every breath. That is who we should honor. When someone rejects truth, that's something else you might want to write down. When someone rejects truth, they will believe what? They'll believe anything. They'll believe anything. What these people are doing, this is pagan. I know we're laughing about it, but this is pagan animism. I got it out. Easy for you to say, right? Easy for you to say. It's earth worship. That's what I just should have said. It's idol worship. Exactly what that book in your laps forbids us to do. So it's not funny. It's not like they have an option to do this. It's blasphemy. Here's a professed 200-year-old Christian seminary doing exactly that. And as I mentioned, uh, I think it was in our, in our judges' study last week or the week before, that God's patience has an end. Aren't you, aren't you thankful that God is long-suffering? Long, he's been long-suffering with me. But God's patience has a limit. And here it is. He tells us in Galatians 5 that God, 6, God will not be mocked. God will not be mocked in what you might be doing in your life if you're living a lifestyle differently than you would here in a Christian church during the week. Then God's not going to be mocked because he sees it all. He sees it all. God is not going to be mocked. This is the epitome of apostasy. Now, the decline, here's another one here. The decline and the fall of Christian America is nothing new. We saw it on the front of, uh, of Time magazine 17 years ago. This is from 2000, 2004. The challenge is that even after this fact was established, not much of the Christian church did anything about it, thus leading to headlines like uh, this one a couple years back, headlines that say, American Christians cave on core beliefs. And the research revealed this. Check this out. 44% agree the Bible, like all sacred writings, contain helpful accounts of ancient myths, but is not literally true. Also says only 50% agree that the Bible has the authority to tell us what we must do. And 51% agree the Bible was written for each person to interpret as he or she chooses. Well, sign me up for that church. Wouldn't that be great? Yeah, interpret it any way you want. The research from the annual status on the state of American theology, this is from 2016, revealing that the number of professing Christians is declining in America. Keep in mind, these are professing Christians. Understand there's a difference between a professing Christian and a possessing Christian. How many people have you met that say that they're a Christian? I'm, I'm an American. I'm a Christian. No, no. You're a Christian because you are born again by the Spirit of the living God by putting your faith in Jesus alone. doesn't mean that you will never sin. We pretty much sin. I, I guarantee you that you sin in your thought. I sin in my thought life every day about something. About something. I, I drive a car. So, of course, I'm going to be sinning in my thought life. Right? So do you. So do you. But we're saved unto serving the king of the universe. And we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that empowers us to say yes to him and no, and no to sin. So here's a, a, a few more shocking facts from an article titled, New Survey, check this out, New Survey Points to Confusion and Compromise in Christian Churches. Less than half of those surveys believe abortion is a sin. 51% say that sex outside of marriage, uh, only 51% say that sex outside of marriage is a sin. Only 40% of those surveyed agreed that hell is an eternal place of judgment where people go who do not personally trust Jesus. Uh, as their Lord and Savior. 64% agreed strongly or somewhat with a statement, God accepts the worship of all religions, including Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. 65% uh, agree everyone sins a little, but most people are good by nature. We already talked about that, right? Another one was more than half. 52% agree by good deeds that I do, I partly contribute to earning my place in heaven. 
There we go. Uh, 59% of Americans agree worshiping alone or with one's family is a valid replacement for regularly attending church. Do not forsake the gathering of the brethren and so much the more as you see the day approaching, right? If that weren't crazy enough, here's some recent headlines. Uh, some of you may not like this, but too baddy waddy, it's true. Here it comes, okay? Southern Baptist Convention president says it's okay to believe in evolution. Even though for some unknown reason to me, Christians let this farce be taught in, uh, in your public schools. That's why I am constantly encouraging you, encouraging you, be active in politics in your community. Run for school board, right? Make some changes. Because you have nothing to complain about, nothing to argue about, if you didn't make a stand. I have tried to train you not on my watch. I'm not going to let it happen on my watch. Because previous generations of Christians let things happen on their watch. 1973. I don't, I, I, Christians allowed abortion. To become legal. Defy God's definition of marriage. Christians allowed that because we wouldn't fight for what the Word of God said. We just rolled over. And uh, I'm telling you, things are too, the time is too short. Be active. Be active. Get out there and make a difference. We allow evolution to be taught in our public schools. There is no, realize this, there is no scientific evidence of evolution because there is zero evidence of a transitional form in the fossil record. You realize that? There has never once been one, trans, <laughs> one transitional form ever found in the fossil. You don't know, understand what a transitional form is. It is one species adapting into, evolving into another species. Not one. Not one. And if Darwinian evolution was true, they'd be what? Everywhere. Everywhere. You would dig your, your, in the backyard for your swimming pool, you would find them. Everywhere. Let me just remind you, theistic evolution is still evolution, and it must be proved scientifically. I know that we, ah, you know, Christians, you know, you can believe in theistic evolution, maybe the gap theory, blah, 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 blah. Fine. You still have to prove evolution scientifically. Can't do it. So the evidence is, uh, is not there. The evidence isn't there. But the lie of evolution has shipwrecked more people's faith than any other topic I'm aware of. And it is so simple to, uh, to refute. It is apostasy to not teach what God says in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. It says, so God created man in what? His own image, in the image of God. He created him what? Male and female. He created them. And on the topic of male and female, thought I was going to skip that, huh? Nope. We're a Calvary. May as well drop the bomb of the headline from Charisma News. Have you, have you read this? It says, apostate church now holding drag queen gospel, insisting God is a woman. And on this topic, here's another headline from last year. United Methodist Church announces proposal to split over gay marriage. And just this week, the largest denomination in Europe, the Church of Sweden, has declared what? Just this week, that it's a trans church. Completely defying the order of gender that both God and God's science has ordained. Now, I've told you, the church for too many years has been known for what it's against. I'm not against people who are confused on their gender identity. I am for God. I am for God. I am for God and His definition of gender. And it, 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 it couldn't be any more clear. And on this, uh, this same church, this same church, uh, they are also one of the ones that declared um, little Greta 
Thunberg, you know who she is, right? Little Greta Thunberg, the, uh, I, I want to adopt that little girl. I just want to hug that little girl. She, she's just as lost as lost can be, and she has been used and manipulated by everyone. But they, they call her their little teenage climate princess. But you know what else they declare her to be? They declare her to be the successor to Jesus Christ, which I'm relatively sure would also fall under the category of apostasy. Anybody with me on that? Yeah, all right, all right. So, so be gracious when you talk. Do your studying. Use all of these hot topics of the day, all the politically correct topics of the day, to be able to use that as a springboard to tell people about Jesus and his plan that he has for their life. Don't beat people up. Don't yell at people. Don't let a vein pop out in your melon. If you can't, if you can't have a, a reasonable, rational conversation with somebody, don't do it. Don't do it. Love your neighbor. Don't yell at your neighbor. If they yell at you, just, just, I'll wait. Let me know when you're done. And then, come now, let us reason together, is what the Bible says. So, try that. Now, then you have my old stomping grounds of San Diego. There's a, uh, there's a professing pastor saying that Jesus was a racist. That's not a smart man to say that Jesus was a racist. Then you have, uh, well-known megachurch pastors saying that we should unhitch ourselves from teaching the Old Testament. And the same guy says that he is embarrassed by churches that remained open during COVID. You heard this guy? Yeah. And we have yet, we have yet to hear an apology from him for belittling those that time has revealed were biblically and legally right. You know, all these all these churches that stood for it, that stood up against uh, anyone telling us that we cannot meet for worship, all those lawsuits, guess what? The churches are winning. The churches are, uh, are winning. And then you have pastors who won't even teach prophecy. What we're, what we're going through today, a third of the Bible, a third of the Bible is prophecy. And you have people who won't teach it. I don't have time to get into their invalid reasons, but uh, here's another one. And according to surveys, remember we're talking about apostasy here. According to surveys, you have half, half, let me see if I got it. Yeah, half of pastors, I think this is uh, also according to Charisma News, uh, half of pastors who are afraid to teach the whole counsel of God on what, what might be controversial topics. Well, too late, right? controversial topics because people might get offended and not come back. Here's the list. 55% of pastors can identify one or more topics on which they would not preach at all or only sparingly because the sermon could neg negatively affect their hearers' willingness to attend church in the future. Among them are politics, so they 38% won't teach on politics, 23% won't teach on homosexuality, 18% won't teach on abortion, same-sex marriage, 17% won't, uh, uh, war, 17%, women's role in the church uh, and home, 13%, the doctrine of election, 13%, hell, 7%, and money, 3%. I remember what Pastor Chuck, Pastor Chuck Smith taught us, taught us years ago. He used to tell us that if we are unwilling to teach the whole counsel of God, go sell insurance. Go do something else. But don't claim to be a pastor who is responsible. The Bible says in James, few of you should presume to be teachers because you will what? Be judged more strictly. If you have... If, and there's so many people that are satisfied going to places that give the same sermon every week with some different story of what happened in their life that week, which I'm all about using illustrations to illustrate the biblical principle. But if it's the same message with, with a little bit of a different spin every week, then you're not teaching them the whole counsel of God. And the reason that they do it is because they don't want to offend anybody, because they don't want to offend anybody. You know, it breaks my heart. It breaks my heart when people leave our church because they 
They just can't stomach what God says in his word. It's like, well, what? you have a Bible. I'm just repeating what God says. Why are you mad at me? Why are you mad at me? Lovable fuzzball that I am. Why would anybody be mad at me? I'm just telling you what God's word says. If you want to take a pair of scissors or you want to take a black magic marker to God's word, that's on you. But God will remove me. He'll remove me, and he should. I wish he would remove a whole lot more pastors that are unwilling to teach the Word of God. They are the ones why we have so much political correctness. They haven't made a stand. We pastors better make a stand. It's, 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 it's not good. It's not an excuse for me not to preach it because people will leave. I would rather have people, this is hard for me to say because I love people, and I know that people are at all different levels on their spiritual growth in the Lord, and we have them we have brand new babies in the Lord, and we have people that have been studying the Bible for 50 years. Uh, and we have people here, maybe even today, that are still yet to give their hearts to Christ. So it breaks my heart when, when people will allow a topic to, to overwhelm the fact that God is trying to woo us with cords of loving kindness into trusting Him and His Word. That's all. All this is, that's all this is about. So I'd rather have people leave the building than have the glory of the Lord leave the building because I will not teach the truth. You realize that's what happened to the Old Testament priests. That's what happened. Read about, read about Hophni Hophni and Phinehas, the sons of uh, Eli in 1, Samuel, in 1 Samuel 4, they defected from the faith, and the result was that the glory of the Lord departed from the temple. And you thought that Phinehas was just a, a, a cartoon character, didn't you? Right. Phinehas and Ferb, right? Ezekiel 11. Ezekiel 11 gives us a similar situation, all because those God chose to lead wouldn't lead God's people God's way. I mean, it's too simple. My responsibility is to lead God's people God's way. They're not my people. You're not my people. You're God's people. My responsibility is to speak the truth in love and let you sort it out with the Lord. Here's a few more headlines to uh, close out this portion on apostasy. U.S. Christians embrace secularism in post-Christian America. 52% of evangelicals now reject absolute moral truth. Here's some that you're really not going to like. How about this? Cheap grace, American evangelicals embrace immorality and socialism. Have you seen that? People don't have the fear of God. The reason that you remain in your sin is because you have no fear of the Lord. And I, I'm the guy that I will come alongside. I will walk you through whatever your, the sin du jour. I will walk you through that. But don't stay in it. Don't remain in it. God isn't going to be mocked. God isn't going to be mocked. And uh, we live in, a, in, in an age where immorality is accepted. It's not accepted. It's not accepted in heaven. It's not going to be accepted in this church. It shouldn't be accepted in any church. How about this one? Barnapol, 40% of Christian evangelicals are pretty much a bunch of socialist, pro-choice pagans. When was the last time you thought you would heard, uh, hear a headline like that in church? Makes you all feel uncomfortable, doesn't it? Makes me get feel uncomfortable, but that defines the church today. And we better, we better understand that. How can we not see that the last day's apostasy is here? Oh, and the only one happy about apostasy in the church, guess who it is? Guess who it is? Guess who it is? It's the devil, right? It's, it's the devil. Did you read that a month ago? One of, his, uh, one of his minions went on social media recently and thanked the progressive church saying that he met a wave of Christian people who agree with him. Here's his quote. We both agree that religion needs what? A massive amount of change. And he says, between your flogged Bibles, asinine ideals, and just outright misinformation, we've had enough. And these apostate, woke, self-professing Christians deny the faith once for all, given to the saints. You better drill down on this. You better drill down on this because persecution is coming. We're getting to that here in a second. Um, here's the antidote. Here's the antidote 
to apostasy. So easy. Let the word of God be your absolute authority. Number two, live your life sold out completely to Jesus without apology. Even if what I am saying this morning offends you, guess what? Guess what? I'm not going to apologize because, again, it's the Word of God that you're upset with. And if that offends you, you haven't allowed the Word of God to be the absolute authority in your life. So let this be your absolute authority. Number three, uh, stand strong when persecuted for your biblical values. we got to stop rolling over. Aren't there people in your life that have bought into just about every lie that the culture has sold us on? How much time are you praying for that person? And then how much time are you actually making to study how to witness to that person, to be able to understand their argument, because you need to understand their argument, you need to understand where they're coming from, and in grace and truth and compassion and kindness and mercy, just like somebody probably did with you, sit down with them, answer their questions, and then let them decide. All right, last section real quick, uh, persecution. Everybody look at me saying, persecution, yay, right? This is, what, this is what Paul told Timothy in the last days. Read your Bibles. And I told you last week or the week before, I bet none of you have this up on a plaque in your house. Verse 12, 2 Timothy 3, read it with me. Yes, everybody, yes, all who desire. You don't even want to say it, ah, huh? live godly, will what? will suffer persecution. If you're going to choose to be one of the ever-decreasing, Bible-believing, Bible-teaching, Bible-living Christians, guess what? You're going to get persecuted for it. You're going to get persecuted for it. But you're building a reputation in heaven. Do you really care what anybody else thinks over what Jesus thinks about you? What's your reputation in heaven this morning? Check this out. Scotland, the land of my people, right? <laughs> Scotland, the land of my people, are trying to outlaw the Bible. Also in Scotland, they are wanting to eliminate any kind of public Christian worship. Did you hear about this? This happened recently. Pastor in London is arrested for giving a sermon on marriage. There it is. There it is. There it is. London pastor arrested for sermon on marriage, and he says, I was only saying what the Bible says. They arrested him. And if you don't think it's going to happen here in this country, you're wrong. Legislation in, uh, in Denmark. Pastors in Denmark are being required to submit their sermons to the government before they can be preached. Can you imagine if I submitted this sermon to our government? To be preached, you think about well, that? There'd be a big red, but redacted, 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 right? They wouldn't let me preach this. Did you know, did you know that uh, pastors and priests and Christians uh, are being murdered in Mexico on a regular basis? You don't hear that on TV. Just do a little research. Did you know that in February, remember when we were all praying for uh, Pastor Coates in Canada when uh, he was arrested for just simply having church services. Remember what the government did? They built a double fence. They built a double fence around his building so that nobody, so nobody could get in there to keep people out of the church. Who does that sound like? Starts with a D, ends in evil, right? It's the devil, right? Then there, were, uh, there was a second pastor arrested, and now three pastors have not just been fined, but jailed in Canada for giving the sermon that I'm giving today, for giving less of a sermon than the one that I, am, that, I am giving, that I am giving today. And the second pastor, did, did, you, did, you, did you check into this? He was, arrested, he was arrested on the freeway. He was arrested on the freeway. Anybody? How many of you are familiar with this? Okay. All right. Here's, uh, let me give you a little video here. It's about 30 seconds long. What's his crime? He taught the Bible. Nobody 
know you're gonna love this. Now, if I get arrested for teaching the Bible, I'm gonna walk out just because I don't like those optics, right? <laughs> I don't like those optics. What's the last picture of Greg? You know, that's, that's not what I want you to think of. That's not what I want you to think of. Six police vehicles to arrest and drag off a pastor. And then the guy videoing, he says this. Shame on you guys. This is not communist China. Don't you guys have family and kids? Whatever happened to Canada? God keep our land glorious and free. What, what, what are you going to do when they come for your kids? What are you going to do when they come for your kids? And you parents that are raising kids right now, you better be setting the example for them. You better be, because your kids, I can't imagine what they're going to have to go through. I'm praying, Lord, just come quickly. Maranatha. That is exactly, that is exactly what they do. That is exactly what they do in communist China. They arrest, they torture, and they jail people simply for their love of Jesus. What are you going to do when they come for you? Will you stand for Jesus and martyr them? Or will you deny your faith? I know it's easy while you're here. Nice little air-conditioned, heated sanctuary. What are you going to do when they come for you? What are you going to do? Hmm. Something to think about. Now, uh, in our country, we're, uh, we're not quite there yet. We're not quite there yet. But it's, it's coming. It's coming. Have you seen these? We're in part of a soft persecution, right? Franklin Graham warns a quality act would be catastrophic for Christians if it becomes law. A quality act will devastate Christian education. Um, might be a time to be considering homeschooling again, right? Here's another one. Uh, Christianity is hate speech, and the Bible could be, uh, will what's happening in Finland finish America? They're trying to be cute, okay? And uh, the Bible could be considered hate speech in Europe, and that philosophy may also come to America. Well, it will. It will definitely come to our America. You just need to be prepared. And, and uh, just understand this. Under the auspice of coronavirus, the haters of God, they went into uh, overtime in their action. And it appears, it appears that Calvary chapels, for whatever reason, are constantly at the point of the spear when it comes to churches to attack. There's government lawsuits against uh, Calvary Chapel Las Vegas, another one against our friend Ken Graves in, uh, in Maine, and then uh, Pastor Jack Hibbs, right? And a lot of you listen to Jack Hibbs, uh, Calvary Chapel Chino Hills, and then there's Rob McCoy at Calvary Chapel Godspeak outside of L.A. They've now been fined over $2 million just because they allowed people like you to come in and worship the Lord. <laughs> all simply for standing on biblical uh, and constitutional right to freedom of worship. And have you heard about this? Got a couple more and we're wrapping up. Uh, you have the University of Iowa. Did you hear about this? University of Iowa kicks InterVarsity off their campus because InterVarsity states that if you're going to be a leader in InterVarsity, you have to have a Christian worldview. InterVarsity, right? InterVarsity. And, uh, and again, they took them to court, and who won? InterVarsity. InterVarsity. Then you have uh, New York. You have New York blames churches for the spread of COVID and that they need to shut them all down. I go, yeah, well, we know what happened to the nursing homes in New York. Yeah. Then we have bakers that are being sued for not making cakes that go against their religious beliefs. And then they have, then they have a third grader, a third grader, for, she gets canceled for wearing a mask that says, Jesus loves me. That's the culture that we are in right now. So again, I just want to wrap up with this. We are living in what we understand as a soft persecution. This isn't communist China. We're not being taken away to re-education camps, but that happens there. And eventually it'll happen here. I'm hoping that it'll happen after the rapture of the church. But you better be prepared. You better be prepared for some persecution where the culture is in the process of criminalizing righteousness and exalting sin. Now, here's the good news. Finally, something to smile about, right? Something to smile about. What a great opportunity we have 
to let our light so shine among men so that people would see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. And you have to understand this. Do a little research on church history. It was persecution that purified the church. It was persecution that expanded the church to go all over the world. And a lot of people, you know, you already know people that have fallen away. Go after them. Leave the 99 on the hill. Go after the one that has wandered off. But realize that the Bible says there is going to be a mass defection from the faith in the time that we are living right now. So don't be surprised. Don't give up on anybody, right? Don't give up on anybody, but be proactive. Be proactive in, uh, in going after them. And, and then just be a person that says, hey, I'm going to make... You don't have to be belligerent about it. Just say, I'm just going to make a stand for, for, for godliness. And when people sin, I'm not going to tolerate it. I'm not going to condone it. I'm not, I'm not the Holy Spirit police. It's not my job to call out everybody. My job is to proclaim the good news that Jesus is still looking for men and women today who will be loyal on his behalf. Those are the people that God uses. I'll invite the worship team to come up and uh, close us in a final song. I know that we are uh, often tempted, we're often tempted to be fearful of, of man. That's the only reason that we don't make a stand in these things. But what was our memory verse for last month? Anybody remember what it was? It says Psalm, 18, Psalm 118, verse 6. Do you remember what it was? I know John's got it because we did it on our ride on the way home, right? Right? What is it? What? The Lord is on my side. I will not fear what can man do to me. Let's pray. God, uh, <laughs> thank you for another opportunity to be able to sound uh, the alert that your coming is near. Your coming is near. Lord, you tell us in the last days that, uh, that there's going to be this mass defection of people who claim to know you. And so, Lord... Uh, the handwriting's on the wall. It's everywhere. Uh, and we're, we're just thanking you for your mercy and for your grace on all of us. And you've left the door of the ark open another day. And there may be people here this morning who have not settled the issue of where they stand with you. There may be people who say that they know you but are in continual habitual sin. Lord, that's not a comfortable place. That's, that's living your life with a question mark. And I'm saying this morning, God, I, I pray that in your patience and long-suffering that not a person would leave this place committed to living their life for you. Lord, you're a good God. You can't turn your back on sin. You provided the atonement, the covering for our sin. If we would just turn our eyes to you, if we would confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved, saved from the penalty of our sin. We just have to admit that all of sin and fall short of the glory of God and the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Thank you for the promise of Romans 5 eight, God, that says... That, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Thank you, Lord. Whoever shall call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Lord, the door is wide open to anybody in the sanctuary, anybody watching uh, from home, somebody who will get this uh, video forwarded to them at some point. Lord, and, and Lord, I just pray that today be the day that people are born again into your kingdom. Work in their hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Wow, and again, so much information today. Ladies, what are some things that you learned today that you could share with somebody right now? Abby? Well, I enjoyed how he said that Noah was considered a conspiracy theorist before it started raining. Mm -hmm. And I liked um, the antidote for apostasy, which was... Let the word of God be your absolute authority. Live your life sold out completely to Jesus without apology. 
and stand strong when persecuted for your biblical values. Mm -hmm. That's right. Now, folks, our world is falling away, and there's no better time than right now to turn to Jesus. If you missed last week's message, you can click right here and pick that up. I encourage you to watch it. Thank you again for joining us here at Calvary Chapel Community Church. If you're not subscribed, you can hit our little subscribe icon and hit the bell, and we'll let you know when we've got more messages just like this. Thank you so much, and have a great day.